Hi there, my name is Chris Cam with MiningNews.net and Aspermont, and with me I have Eddie Rigg with Argonaut. Eddie, we just came off a fantastic panel about uh, super cycles in general and some of the trends that we're seeing. You brought up a really interesting point around the Lausanne curve and some research that Argonaut had done around capital raisings and securing finance at the right times. I was hoping you could give us a bit more detail about that research. Yeah, so raising finance is one element of it, but it was also looking at what were the companies which sort of able to make discovery through to production? What were the pitfalls? What were the things they did they did right? And then what we did was proper research. So we went back and we looked at 176 companies which have released scoping studies from 1 January 2000 to 31 December 2022. And we looked at those 176 companies and we looked at what, what the companies which performed really well, and when I say performing well, it was time from discovery through to production, but most importantly, shareholder value. Not necessarily increase in market cap, but shareholder value. So who had the greatest increase in share price? And so it was a really interesting study we did. And as part of that, what came out was some really interesting sort of results, which we didn't quite know when we started the process. Okay, and what are some of those results that were unexpected? Well, the, the, the biggest impact on shareholder value was raising the most money early. Now, it's counterintuitive that the more money you raise in the expiration phase, the less dilution you have, the faster you get in production. It sort of makes sense faster in production, but less dilution, um, it sort of doesn't make sense because people go, you're issuing shares, therefore, aren't you diluting the company? But what we found was, and it's typical with the Lasson curve, in the expiration phase, you've got this whole concept of people going, this is the investor sentiment, investor mindset is, how much money can I, can I make? How big is this thing going to be? So they're always thinking in the positive things and they're prepared to put money into things without the thorough detail which comes from a scoping study or pre-feasibility study. And we found those companies which said, hang on, my share price is running, it's going really well, I'm still drilling, I haven't put a study out, let's raise $100 million. Those companies did better than those companies which said, oh, my spreadsheet, I'm doing some early work and I reckon it's worth this value per share. And when I put out my scoping study, my pre-feasibility study, all these investors will see how good it is and therefore they'll put money in at that price. And so as it turns out, that doesn't happen. It's interesting from my perspective because we obviously, as you do, talk to a lot of corporates and you'd think some of this stuff is intuitive. Perth in particular, home to the mining industry, and you would have thought some of this stuff is well known, but from what you're saying, this is a, a little bit of a surprise. It was a really big surprise to us, right, that so many companies, and even when we got this study results, it wasn't just raising money, there's a couple other characteristics which I'll talk about in a moment, but trying to explain to these guys, raise money now because one, the market's open, two, people aren't too concerned about have you got some issues with permitting, have you got some issues with capabilities within your own team, they're just focused on how big it is and how much money I'm gonna, I'm gonna make. So take advantage of that greed factor, take advantage of that greed factor and raise money now and raise more. I can tell you this, over my 30 years of being an investment banker, I've never had a company come up to me and say, geez, I shouldn't have raised all that money. I've, but the now the times we've returned money back to investors and we haven't, we've only taken a fraction of what's been offered to us, the number of times people come up to me and said, geez, I wish I'd taken that money. It's just, it's so funny. Never once I've raised too much money. It's always, I should have raised more money. And so I'm just telling these investors, and I, I know they will say, oh, but Eddie, you've got a conflict of interest here because you're all about raising money. You get paid by raising money. But I can tell you that empirical evidence is the more money you raise, the better off you are at developing your project. You make better decisions, you do it faster, and you've got money to apply on the exploration study work. So it's essentially, you're looking at a bit of a pillow that allows a corporate to make the right decisions, to not be stressed about the share price, about investor sentiment. They're backed, and essentially, they can concentrate on the project and actually building something. That's right. Now, there's a couple other, that, that's absolutely right, um, Chris, but there was a couple of other elements which came out of it. So some companies, um, they also the purpose of raising extra money allows them a dual strategy to do exploration whilst they're doing the study work. What we found, and this is also part of the study, what we found was that when people put out their initial scoping study or pre-feasibility study, that was when the projects looked their best. They never, I can tell you now, other than the commodity price going up, there was no pleasant surprises. Like they come out and they say, we've done some initial bottleneck roll, uh, bottleneck roll tests and we the met looks okay. But when they go into detail, all of a sudden the recoveries where they thought were 
high 90s, all of a sudden go to 92, 93. All of a sudden, oh, we've got an extra permit. Oh, we do hydrology test work. We've got water or we lack water. There's all these things go on. So the best a project typically looks is at the scoping study phase and it only gets worse. There's very few pleasant surprises. So I'm an investor. You see at the top of the market, the scoping study, and that's as good as it gets. It doesn't get any better. There's no pleasant surprises. Rare, sorry, there's rarely a pleasant surprise during a process. Where they can have a pleasant surprise is where you actually make another discovery. Okay. And all of a sudden you've got your main discovery. You find another discovery, particularly if it's high grade or close to the surface where you can bring in. And if, if you've got two sources of ore, it reduces your risk, right? Yeah. So that was, once again, you can only do exploration whilst you're doing mm. detailed study work if you've got plenty of cash. Yeah. Okay, so that's one thing. In that, that study phase, the mindset of the investor goes to you know, all these risks because you identify the risk. Everyone starts focusing on the risk. Mm. Everyone starts focusing on does the team have the capabilities to build this mine? Yeah. And so there's, it goes to a more of a conservative mindset. So one of the other things we found through this process, and it was mentioned by Daniel from you know, ANZ on, on our panel session, um, how they, they love this concept is that these juniors bring in majors as a joint venture partner. Now, a joint venture partner who is a major has typically built a mine. It has the financial capa case, uh, capa uh, capability, sorry, capability to do it, and they've also um, they've also got the the routes to market. So some products, you know, it's, it, it, has, it doesn't have like a goal with a terminal market. It mm -hmm. actually needs an off take partner. So these major companies bring all those things, and they bring teams which can do it. So they they address the risk factors which cause the investor to be concerned. The other part about it is typically these majors will do a joint venture structure which reflects the MPV of the project. It will be a discount to the MPV or in the case of Gold Road, which did that uh, famous deal on Greer, mm. um, uh, they did that actually MPV. So it was an amazing outcome for the guys at Gold Road. But most of the time, the majors will do a deal reflecting the MPV of the project as against the market cap of the company. So if the market cap of the company has dropped off as it's gone into that study phase, a joint venture will then readdress what the real value of that asset is. Okay, really interesting that you talk about getting that major party involved or a larger party, at least a minor. Yeah. Uh, we've just spoken uh, with Mark at Polar X. Uh, I know that you're very familiar with, mm. with Mark and the company. They've got that deal with Northern Star where Northern Star is underwriting a rights issue. Mm. Mark seemed to think that was a fairly, well, he knew it was rare, um, he thought it might be the first time it's done. What's your view on that structure and how important is it? What Northern Star is sending a very clear signal is that they want a long-term relationship with this company, right? Yeah. And why do they want a long-term relationship? Because they want their all. They want their all, right? Now, I don't know Polar X as well. I know Mark Bojanak very well. We worked together 30 some years ago, but if Northern Star is doing that, it's they str see strategic value in what he's doing, right? And one of the best ways to do it is give him the money to do it, Major companies, I've got to say this, major companies, as the evidence as well shows, that they're not particularly good explorers. They're better, they're better at buying things which have been proved to a certain level. What Mark's doing with his team is actually proving a project to a certain level. They produce an ore, quality ore. Well, guess what? Um, you know, Northern Star has a solution of processing at Pogo, right? They can process the ore there more efficiently than building another you know, processing facility. So we see more and more of these opportunities where... It's like the hub and spoke process with people who talk about where you've got a processing facility. Um, we don't need more processing facilities, in particularly in West Australia in the, in, the, in the gold fields. We don't need more processing facilities. We just need those processing facilities full. And there's a lot of juniors sitting on nice ore bodies. So we've got to learn and make sure that these, these companies can do these transactions, which allows those, that ore to go through that processing plant in the most efficient manner. Okay, and the other thing that I wanted to touch on that we brought up on this panel was the supply side response to the coming super cycle, if we're going to be so yeah. grand as to say it is definitely coming. Yeah. Um, a lot of talk is around the demand side, what's driving it. Some of the realities around a supply side response mm. potentially need to be checked. Is that, if that's your view? That's the view, not so much my view, it's the view of Argonaut. And we, yeah, we've got a lot of pretty intelligent people, a lot of people a lot smarter than me, thank God. Um, but these guys, yeah, we, we've got six geologists, couple of mining engineers, metallurgists, um, chemical engineers on staff, right? But what we do, we go and see projects. 
we we go and see we're we're a really demand side uh, sorry a supply side led firm we know we go to mine sites we know when they're going to produce you know how much they're going to produce realistic expectations on production outlooks right we've been involved in and funding i i believe since the gfc more new mines either as equity or debt around the world than any other if financial intermediary so that's a big call, but I'm pretty certain that's the number, right? We're, and But we do know when they're going to go into production. And what happens is, and this is something which goes back to the scoping studies, a company comes out and says, the scoping study says, I'm going to produce 300,000 tonne of SC6 in three years' time. As soon as they come out with that, all the... Yeah, the, into the big bulge bracket banks and the and the um, and the government organisations put it into their spreadsheet, and they just assume that's what's coming. Let me tell you, that just doesn't happen. For a start, we saw with the SNL research, which I've put up on the screen. It's typically up to seventeen years now for a project of of significant size to go from discovery into production. So. When you put out a scoping study, that's the best a project looks. It's also the best a project looks ever as to a development time frame. You can almost, I wouldn't say double, but because that's just a, that's too generalistic. But these projects are not coming on stream as fast as people think. We also have a situation where the recoveries are nowhere near as good as we think. So, you know, when these companies come out and say, we're going to get 70 plus percent recovery, you know, on a lithium project, well, the reality is it's more likely 50 and we've just seen in a project in Brazil where the recovery has been even way less than that because they didn't realise they had such a fines product and the fines product on a DMS doesn't recover at all. So all that fines material, so they had a unit of lithium, they said we can recover this much, but of that unit, the reality was about half of it was not recoverable through a DMS plant, right, because it went off to the side. So ultimately it might get recovered through a float circuit but definitely can't be re recovered from a DMS. So but we've seen this on many different products and even... You know, Galena, which is uh, an iron ore, uh, sorry, a, a lead zinc project, you know, that was supposed to be producing all these tons of, you know, lead units and zinc units. Well, guess what? You know, it's not happening, right? And we've seen it time and time again. The actual, the actual production date or the commissioning date is far longer than we thought. And to the ramp up to full, full production levels takes longer or, or sometimes never achieve never achieved right mm -hmm. so you know when we look at what we see these some of these bold brackets and these government organizations saying as the production profile we don't believe on the supply side we don't believe it mm -hmm. and we know it and we can I, I mean i i love to go in and go specific on details but i don't want it because some of the mds of those companies don't like me saying this sort of things but i can tell you now the estimation of future supply of lithium is nothing like what you're hearing out there. It's just not going to get to where the people are saying. Okay. Um, I can understand it from a government perspective with respect to any uh, government officials watching. Um, less so with the, with the banks. You do see the bank notes coming out say, we're seeing that we're expecting this copper supply, for example, over the next 10 years, and they will factor in um, supply side disruptions and a... Uh, I don't know what the term is, but like a, a mortality rate's a wrong term. But essentially, yeah. some of these projects are, are being scoped, not coming online. Is it the case of even with that factored in, it's, it's still less? Still less. Okay. And, and, and you've got that. But also you've got with the banks, and the banks are a bit more conservative, right? So I accept yeah. the banks are more conservative than the government organisations and some of these you know, marketing groups, right? Commodity marketing groups. But the other thing which we're seeing is, and not so much in perhaps in WA, um, but we're seeing, as these projects are proving to be better and better, we're also seeing the government's putting their hand out saying, I want a greater market share. I want a, sorry, no, I want a greater share of this project, right? And that creates enormous challenges to finance those projects. So um, so not only is it just taking long to develop, the fact is they're becoming more difficult to finance if they're not pretty much in WA. Okay. And while I still have you, Eddie, I just wanted to get your views overall on 2024. What are you looking at in terms of industry trends and then probably investor appetite and some of the trends there too? Yeah, so one more topical is lithium, right? So if you said to me in 2022, um, going into 2023, would lithium go through $3,000 and SC6? I would have said, you know, or if it was coming off a low sort of five, 600 buck price, I would have said, oh, I doubt it. I don't think so, but geez, wouldn't that be good? And then it went through 3,000, you know, in 
uh, late 22 and again in 23, we go, well, we'll get to 5,000. Well, we went through 5,000. Then, then it went to nearly $8,000, right, which is just ridiculous, right? That created some problems because um, there was money flowing into the space and there was money flowing into some ordinary projects run by, you know, to be honest with you, ordinary people, right? So that money is going to be wasted and burnt. There was also some great projects discovered like Azure and Wildcat, et cetera. Um, and and the, the, perhaps the best one is Patriots Project in, you know, in, in, in Canada, which is just mind bogglingly good, right? But but what but what, what this did was it sort of it created this when you got these ups and downs, whiptail, we're always going to undershoot on the downside. Someone said to me, you know, when the price was eight thousand, would you see the lithium price back below a thousand bucks? I said, no way. It it dropped that fast back to below a thousand dollars. It was just amazing, right? So that doesn't create an environment for for long term sustainable funding of projects, right? So long story short, do I think the market's more mature now? Hopefully in lithium, but you know it's early days still. But you know the price last week was twelve hundred dollars SC six equivalent price was pilbered into sale. We see that price sort of between a thousand and fifteen hundred for the rest of the year. But we do see going forward a seventeen fifty to twenty five hundred dollar US dollar price, which is a good price to be producing lithium. Right. So we're outlook for lithium we think is positive. Um, Gold's interesting. Um, we love gold. Our firms always love gold. We just love it, right? Um, we love gold miners. We love gold. Um, gold's you know, all-time record high, US dollar, Aussie dollar, right? That happened, I think, last week. So typically with something at all-time high, you've got to be saying, well, surely it's going to go down or revert to the mean. But on super cycle, that doesn't happen, right? Um, but with all the uncertainty around the world and the fact that the, I think my understanding there's more federal elections globally in the, this calendar year than there's ever been ever in the history of mankind, right? So it creates a lot of uncertainty. And then you've got the US where you've got, um, if they're the two leaders, the best leaders of the free world in Biden and um, Trump, then I'll go he, right? So, but um, that creates a lot of uncertainty. We've also got China and we've got Russia doing things in Ukraine. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty in this world. Um, so there's a real argument for gold, right? Um, but what we're seeing is that in the last, since December, we've seen most probably that sort of 15 to 25 percent increase on their major gold producers. We've seen the, the top tier developers pretty much flatline. Mm. And that's really unusual. And when the advanced explorer has been completely almost unloved. So at our, at our glance view is that we're going to see this tr a trickle down effect on, on invest interest into those advanced developers, uh, the developers and the advanced explorers, and they'll grab a bite. Yeah, you know, they'll grab a bid. Sorry, mm -hmm. and there'll be some interest in those stocks. So we're quite positive on those developers, smaller gold producers, developers, and advanced explorers. So one of our best picks is Degray. We we love Degray. That, that, that's, I'm on record of saying that. But that project is so good. It's so good, but it's been flatlined since December. It was, I think, the stock was at one twenty eight, one thirty in December. It's still one twenty eight, one thirty today. Whereas a Northern Stars sort of up two or three dollars, and and you know Emerald's up two dollars, you know, up yeah you know, thirty percent. So there's a whole lot of gold producers are up getting the benefit of this great gold price. But surely the the, the gold in the ground is still of good value. So we, we're pretty positive gold. And the commodity I, I think we're overall most solid on is actually copper. Um, look, you know, copper is is traditionally been the, the best, the school, the other, the bunnings of the, you know, the commodity sp uh, space, right? It's the one which best reflects G global GDP. Um, and, you know, the US has been reasonable growth. Europe is a little bit of growth. Um, uh, China has been stagnant. But in this new world of electrification of everything, decarbonisation, the amount of copper you need now is is never been greater, right? So there's three to four times more copper in an EV vehicle versus an internal combustion engine, right? There's more, there's the amount of copper you use in a direct drive turbine, wind turbine, sort of, you know, windmill, it's just amazing, right? And if you're going to do a solar farm, the amount of copper you need to lock, you know, link it all up and then drive, it's just amazing, right? So you know, we're seeing copper, the, the structural outlook for copper is amazing. The other part with copper is that where you find copper, you know, in parts of South America and, and, and some parts in, um, in Africa, the nationalisation of those assets seems to be rife. So developing new projects is challenging. And so we don't have as much copper in Australia as we'd like. Um, and you know, there's a bit of copper in Canada, but so we're, we're really positive 
on the, the demand side for copper. On the supply side, we're not seeing where it's coming from. So we think there has to be a greater incentive price than we are at the moment. So you know, we, there's a couple of copper stories we really like out there. We, we're a small company we're a bit involved with Firefly in Canada. We love that project. But we do think one which we're not involved with, but we do like is some, uh, Metals Acquisition Corp. It's, in, it's here in Cobar District in New South Wales. Um, it's a, quite a high cost producer. But that means it's really leveraged to the upside in the copper price. So that's one I think you know people can safely sort of bet on that one there. So, so there we are. I think we are positive on lithium. We are positive on gold. Um, we're very positive, strongly positive on copper. Maybe a longer story. Rare earths we love, but that is a challenging game, and, and that one's a bit beyond my pay grade, I reckon, at the moment. So, All right. So it's the question about uh, what yeah. you thought of the event, expectations, and whether it was worth your while coming up, basically. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate being here. And uh, as I said to you, I, I really thank uh, Mining Select and Aspermont for putting it on. I've enjoyed it. I've come over here. Um, it's a good opportunity for me to come from Perth to Sydney. Um, I've also enjoyed the other presentations, right? So, and some of these companies we don't hear about in WA. So I, I mean, it was really interesting from my perspective. And I look forward to the afternoon sessions in particular. There's a couple of companies I want to listen to. And, and as I said, we've got Ben Clifford from our office talking and he's a very polished man. But the other part, the only bit I'd love to have more of, but I know it's really challenging, is, is having institutional investors here. But given the nature of the conference, they can always watch it on, online, right? But, you know, when I walked out of our panel session, you know, after oh, sorry, the morning session, you know, there's three or four investors there wanting to know all sorts of questions. So from our perspective, it's good to be involved and Argonaut's pleased to be involved. And then we thank Aspirant and Mining Selection. Eddie, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Uh,